Snuff films were always a thing of urban legend. Nobody was ever sure if they existed, but everybody knew someone who claimed that they saw them. But when the internet came around, in sites such as Rotten.com and JustMeat.com, you could see them for yourself. But in the Ukraine in 2007, two boys took it too far and decided to make their own snuff film, as well as go on a rampage. This is the story of the Dnipro-Trovsk maniacs. Welcome to Enter the Dark. Hello and welcome to Enter the Dark. I am Jan from Film Daddy. With me as always is Les from Tales from the Hangman. Les, how are you? I'm alright. Good. I'm all good. Right, guys, um, first of all, thank you. I know on one of the other videos we said we might have got past a thousand, but this is the first time we're recording where we have actually officially gone past a thousand subscribers. So, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. That's dead, dead nice. It is. We know, as we always say, you don't have to subscribe, but you have, and that means so much to us. So, thank you. But enough of this nice shit for you now. And we're going to get straight into this one. Some nasty shit. Because this is fucking nasty shit. Now, we're going to be talking about... <laughs> are you ready for this? The Dniprotrovsk Maniacs. Okay? From now on, I'm going to be called Dnipro. Because I know there is a football team called Dnipro from Dniprotrovsk. And I can't say it. Clearly, because you know, I'm, you guys know, I can't pronounce names. But, a big shout out to the book that most of this research come from that I was reading, and it's called Psycho.com by Eileen Ormsby. You can get it on Amazon and on Kindle and on Kindle Unlimited. So if you've got a Kindle Unlimited subscription, you can read it for free. We'll stick a link in, won't we? Yeah, we'll put a link in the description for you. It's a fantastic book. It's about serial killers on the internet. I haven't even got to the rest of the book because of these two guys, and I was like, holy shit, we're going to have to do a video on them. Because basically, if you've heard of a video called Three Guys and One Hammer, which is a snuff film, and it was all over the internet, you've heard of these guys, because that is their handiwork. I've seen it. I didn't manage to get all through the eight minutes without skipping. Les, have you seen it? Yeah. Did you manage to watch it all? Yeah. And what did you think of it? It was was awful. It truly was. It is out there, so if you want to look it up, by all means, you can do that, but we are not held responsible for anything. No, we're not going to stop you, but we're we're not going to encourage you. No, you probably won't want to eat afterwards or before it. Ever. Yeah, ever. It is disgusting, but we will get to that. So, without much further ado, let's jump into this one. In 1998, in Dnipro, Ukraine, because I'm not saying Dnipro Trovsk, I can say it all right. Actually, yeah. You're saying it all right. Uh, you have a crack. I'll have a crack. Have a crack. Improve yourself. You're saying I'm not perfect. You know I think you're perfect, babe. Thank you, sweetie. In 1998, in Dnipro-Trovsk, Ukraine, two boys were born. Viktor Seyanko was born on the 1st of March, and Igor Spurionik was born on the 20th of April. Now, both of these boys were born into a comfortable middle-class background. A bit of background here for the Ukraine. The Soviet Union had fallen, so Ukraine was independent now. And as anyone who broke away from the Soviet Union thought this would be a time of, you know, prosperity for everybody there instead of living under a communist regime. It wasn't. It was for some, and for others, it was absolutely horrible for him. But these boys were born into comfortable middle-class backgrounds. Victor's father was a computer engineer who also worked with the public prosecutions. And Igor's father was a pilot who flew the Ukrainian president, Leonid Kuchma, around the world. So, you know, these people have got it pretty much made. Yeah, yeah. You know, they weren't left alone. They've got mothers with them who spent all the time with them growing up. And they doted on the boys as well. They weren't without family affection or anything like that. They met in school and they became friends, along with Victor's lifelong friend, Alexander Hanzi. And the three boys, they did everything together. They were inseparable. Now, Alexander lived in the poorer part of town. And as he said, they had rats the size of dogs roaming the building where he lived. I fucking hate rats. I don't like rats. No, I'm like, literally, people hate spiders and like, oh, no spiders. Fucking hate rats. Me cats catch them and kill them. 
right, and leave him by the back door. I will not go anywhere near the door. I can't look at him. My wife has to go and shove it in the bin before, oh, honestly. Can't, I feel the males like, have got massive balls. I don't care. I don't look at the balls. I just see a long tail and fucking run. They just It's like two space hoppers, like relative size. Uh, you know, like that's. it looks like a space hopper between the... Are the they gauge. dragging on the floor? Behind they it. look like they should. I think the way they're positioned. I once, I once wanted to buy some rats because I was told they were interesting pets, you know, because they do tricks and shit. I know a lot of people who've got rats as pets. If you have got rats as pets, this you know, isn't a... that's not a slight on you. It's just a phobia I've got. I mean, I'm sure your rats are nice and you love them and you could talk to, tell me, but I wouldn't go in the same room as them. One friend, I went around the house once and they just run a marathon. They had a rat and it used to run around free. Yeah, you used to let it run around free in the was house. It, was that big? Was it a big rat? I didn't care. As t- I went in that house, I'd gaffer tape my trousers around the bottom. I'm serious. Right, no, gaffer ta- I gaffer taped him, and any time it come near me, I was like, rat, 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 rat. And my mate, who'd run a marathon and was obviously aching, had to get up and pick the rat up. And he literally was like, jump me, put it in the cage. And I'm like, fucking yes, it's a rat. It's, Don't yeah. let it have run of the house. How big were the dogs? What dogs? Like in the uh, in the Ukrainian flag. Oh, Jesus. I thought you were on about my mates, and He didn't have dogs. Um, I don't know. He says rats the size of dogs. I'm imagining, like, my dogs, Yorkshire Terriers. Yeah, that is pretty big. For a rat. For a rat, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so he had them fucking massive rats roaming there. So you can see the, you know, just parity between the people living comfortably and the people not so. While they were all teenagers, Igor and Victor got computers at home, which is rare at the time for anyone at the Ukraine. Obviously, you had to be rich for having computers to go on the internet with. Oh, yeah. What what time period would this be? We're well, teenagers, so they were born in 1988, so early 2000s. So the internet, you, you just you started to see broad. Yeah, you started getting in. good internet. Yeah. Yeah, you're not like downloading a picture for six hours. And the dial-up. Yeah. Oh, the old dial-up sound. Yeah, so, oh, that was great, wasn't it? It was. To be honest, that's nostalgia. People are like, oh, I hated that. It's like, no, that meant that your porn was coming. Yeah, I know, but it also meant that you got to wait six hours for a really blurry picture. Of Gillian Anderson. Yeah, which was fake. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so... Yeah, they had internet, so they used to go on the internet and spend hours going around all the different sites, just like normal teenagers, you know. But the boys, they did fear someone, and that was the bullies at the 96th secondary school. So the bullies there used to prey on people's phobias. So if you've got, like me, phobia of rats, they'd get rats. Les got a phobia of commitment, they'd make him get married. (laughs) It's true, I do have a phobia of commitment. (laughs) <laughs> but not a phobia of, of making children I know, it's um, Ironic It's ironic, very ironic <laughs> Sorry to point out your flaws and your personality and don't, life Don't tell them how I live um. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so these boys, Victor and Eager said Oh shit, you know, we've got phobias, we better get rid of them They've got a phobia of heights So they went onto the internet to find all the answers because, you know, Google knows everything. Yeah. And they decided to face their Would fears. Would it have been Yahoo back then? No. Would Google have been... They probably asked Jeeves. Let's say they asked Jeeves. They asked Jeeves. They asked Jeeves and they said, face your fears head on. So Eager convinced Victor to stand on the edge of a 14th floor balcony and hang over the railings, wow. right? Staring straight at the ground until they both felt fine. And they were like, yep, yeah, that's our fear gone. We've got no phobia. Makes sense. It makes sense. But then, Victor, Igor, and Alexander then started to become school bullies. They targeted anyone who they deemed weaker than them. So it's like smaller kids, kids in younger years, you know, kids with disabilities, anything like that. They'd pick on them. Beware those who slay monsters, folks. Nietzsche. Ooh, check you out, Mr. Ooh, oh, I, Mr. I read Nietzsche. I'm I, so edgy. I read Nietzsche. I like Jordan Peterson. I'm a fascist. I'm not a fascist. Don't take that out of context, please. <laughs> I'm leaving it in. 
But Victor's parents did forbid him from hanging around with Igor after the police came to the house and they told his parents that the bike that Igor had given um, Victor actually belonged to another boy and Igor had stolen. Naughty. Due to Victor's father's influence, though, there was no charges were brought against him and he did not supervise where the son was. So he just continued to hang out with him. Top parenting. Yeah. You know, say, so can't hang out with him. I'm getting out. Where are you going? Out. Are you going out with Igor? No. But in 2002, a teacher complained that Igor and Alexander committed, quotation marks, acts of vandalism towards her. Doesn't say what it is. No. Well, acts of vandalism. Just just acts of vandalism. Yeah. On, it, on her or to her. Against her. Against her. Well, so towards her. Towards her. So they didn't just spray paint her. No, they probably, like, spray. wrote... A cock on a bin. Yeah, or something. Or, like, Miss Quilienko sucks yeek. Or something. I know. But anyway, there was no charges were brought against Eagle because of his dad. You know what I mean? So, he was just sent to a neighbouring school and Alexander was sent to a vocational school. And local residents lived in fear of the three guys, right? They would do whatever they wanted... But due to the influence of the parents, nobody bothered call the police because any charges would be dropped. So these three guys literally run of the town. They can go around doing whatever the fuck they want. Police aren't going to touch them because... No consequences. No, because like, you know, dads are probably prosecutions. The other one's a pilot for the fucking president. You've got a bit of influence there. Yeah. Which will also come into play later. But Igor emerged as the dominant member of the group and started to lead them into increasingly serious acts of vandalism and violence. He also developed a love of Adolf Hitler. Old Adolf. Old Adolf. Oh, that fun guy. Yeah. Oh, Oh, look at his stash. And he proudly went around telling people, I share the same birthday as Hitler. Now, I know you do that just to freak people out. Yeah. Bold in the Ukraine, though, that. It is. Considering. Considering history. Yeah. Pretty bold. Hmm. But he would take photos of himself with a Hitler moustache. Okay, that's quite funny. Giving the Nazi salute. Not so funny. And would spray swastikas wherever he could. He kind of did that when you were a kid. I never... My granddad was in a fucking concentration camp. Oh, (laughs) shit. So I never went around fucking spraying swastikas and pretending to be Hitler. No, nor did I. I once punched a guy who had shaved himself a Hitler moustache and given himself a comb over for the day because he thought it was funny. And he was like walking around and he was like, oh, you don't want to talk to me because you think I look like Hitler. (laughs) And I was like, I don't talk to you because you're obviously a prick. And then he said something and I just punched him. Was that a non-uniform day? No, this this was one when we were at school. Oh, right. This is when I was like 21. He was just walking around town. Pretending to be Hitler. He was a guy who I knew he used to go in the pubs. He was a bit of a prick. Anyway. One of them at the stage door. We no, all know the he used cat. to go up the reggae. I'm trying to think of his name now. I think it was began with a B. Bernard or something. I can't remember. Anyway, enough about that. My Nazi punching days. Yeah. The thing is, though, you know, if you're going to punch someone, punch a fucking Nazi. Yeah. You know, because if anyone deserves a punch in the face... It's a fucking Nazi. Do it. Yeah, go. Everyone who's listening to this, go and punch a Nazi. Just Even if they're really old, just go and punch him. Because why would you punch him? He's a fucking Nazi. Well, spe- no, what, nobody can tell you you were wrong for doing that. Especially if they were really old. Because A, they can't fight back. And B, they were probably involved. Yeah, you know. Also, watch Hunters on Amazon. It's dead good. So, <laughs> where was That's it? getting demonetised. <laughs> Yeah. Punch a fucking Nazi! <laughs> anyway, Alexander then told the others he had a fear of blood. So they were like, don't worry, we'll help you. You need to face your fears. So they decided the best way to do this, and bit of a warning now, animal abuse coming up. The best way they would do this would be to kill animals. Oh. So where they lived, there was loads of stray cats and dogs. So they go out and catch a stray cat or dog. And it became their regular pastime and they would start to torture the animals before killing them. So they'd catch a stray dog or cat, used to just kill it, loot blood, still got phobia. Uh, yeah, I don't like that. This is where it gets disgusting now, guys. So, you know, viewer discretion is advised. They would skin cats alive and would hang dogs from trees and disembowel them. 
Ego then used the blood to paint swastikas on trees and fences. They would then take photographs of them posing with the dead animals. And they had a collection of over a hundred photographs. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's when it's getting creepy. Mm. I mean, it was it was creepy before, but the, the photos had another dynamic, I'd say. Yeah, even when Alexander had gotten over his phobia, they continued to torture animals as they believed it would toughen them up for adulthood. Not really. No. Because if you try to fucking torture somebody face to face, they will fucking fight back. Which you will find out there's a running theme with how they attack people. So, oh, right. I don't know if we... Yeah, I'm going to read it. Guys, skip ahead about 20 seconds if you don't want to hear some graphic detail on animal mutilation, okay? Skip ahead about 20 seconds. One day, they made a wooden cross and nailed a kitten to it. They filled its mouth with glue so nobody would hear it and shot it with rubber bullets. They filmed the attack and laughed until it died. Oh, shit. Yeah. So these guys are sick fucks. Yeah, that's that's horrible. Mm-hmm. After they graduated high school, Victor and Eagle spent more time on the internet. That's when they discovered gore sites such as Rotten.com, JustMeat.com, or the others, which allowed them to watch gore videos on the oh, computer. Oh, Just Meat? Yeah. As in meat? What did you think? I, I thought like- that was a dating site, Just Meat. Just Meat? Why would three guys, one hammer be on a dating site? Some people are sick, Jan. I know that. I'm reading about them now. Our entire channel's about sick people. I know that, but no one would put it on a dating site, would no, they? No, but it just sounded like... I mean, like, trolling on a dating site, like, Luke, smashy, smashy. Gonna smash you. No, Les. It does sound like a dating site. Just meat. Just, com. just meat. Okay, like meat. Now I know... It doesn't seem so strange. Their favourites were photos and videos of real murders by drug cartel bosses or the beheadings by terrorist groups. Around this time, Eagle's father brought him a green deo as a graduation present, and Eagle declared it as a taxi so his father wouldn't keep on to him about getting a job. So, it was an illegal taxi. It wasn't licensed, it wasn't registered to him as a taxi. He just declared it was a taxi to his dad. He ah, said, right. I'm using it as a taxi dad, I've got this job. So what they used to do is rob people in the car. They would pick them up, drive them somewhere quiet, rob them. Then they would dump them and go to a remote area. Well, they'd drive them to a remote area and dump them. So they'd have no belongings, no money, no phone, and they'd be miles away from where they needed to be. Kind of like what you do on Grand Theft Auto sometimes. Literally, yeah, what you do on there. Alexander needed the money, but Victor and Igor didn't. They just did it for the adrenaline rush. Alexander, he was becoming uneasy with the robberies. He felt that they were going to kill somebody. And after two armed robberies on March the 1st, he claimed he'd no longer take part in any of this. Because he's like, you guys are enjoying this bit too much. You're going too far with it. One day, Victor and Eagle picked up a couple to rob, but it was in the day this time, which was a change of their usual MO because they usually do it at night. Yeah. They decided that they could be easily identified, so the best course of action would be to kill the passengers. So there's no record here as if they did kill them, or if they just dumped them and left them for dead, or anything like that. But on this day is the day they decided they would start to kill. The first of their murders took place on the 26th of June 2007. Yekaterina Ilchenko was a 33-year-old teacher at the local university, and had spent the evening with her friend and her mother... Natalia Ilichenko. Now, they'd enjoyed a meal, and at 10pm, Yekaterina decided to walk her friend home, which was only a short distance. And they asked the mum if she wanted to come with her, but her mum was tired, so she said, I'm just going to go to bed, I'll see you when you get in. Right. Around 4.30am, Natalia woke up, and she went to check to see if her daughter was back. But she discovered that her bed had not been slept in. So, obviously... That's a bad sign. That's a bad sign, she's worried... So she went outside to see if she could see her, and she saw three women not far away, talking loudly and panicking. As she approached, she saw Yekaterina lying on the floor in a pool of blood, with her hands over her face as if she'd been protecting herself. Natalia stated that there was no face, only parts of it. Oh my god! What happened was, Yekaterina was walking back to her apartment, and she was less than 100 metres away from the door. 
Victor and Igor stood at the side of the path, and as Yekaterina walked past, Igor spun around and he hit her in the side of the head with a hammock concealed in a plastic bag. The first blow instantly killed her. However, he would continue to beat her until she had no face left. Oh my Christ. And then, with the adrenaline flowing, they decided they would kill again and did so again within the hour. They found a homeless man, Roman Tatrovich, sleeping on a bench. They beat his face with the hammer again and again until every bone in his head was crushed. The only saving grace about this is he probably didn't know anything happened. So he's fast asleep. Probably killed him with the first blow. But as you can see there, these are fucking vicious attacks. Yeah, that's the, the level of violence there is... However, you can see, hitting her from behind and hitting a sleeping man. Remember how they only picked on the kids who were younger than him and weaker? The next murders came six days later on the 1st of July 2007. They took place 15 miles away in the town of Novomoskovsk. Butchered it, but it's there. Not much is known about these victims, who were called Yevgeny Gershenko and Nikolai Surchuk. However, their skulls were crushed after repeated blows with a blunt object. Jeez. Five days later, on the 6th of July 2007, which incidentally is my son's birthday. Oh. Like, that was the day he was born, 6th of July 2007. Nice. Happy birthday, Bran. Victor and Eagle slaughtered three more people. I was in a maternity room, so it wasn't me. First victim of the night was Igor Nechfoloda, who was recently discharged soldier who was walking back from a nightclub. Now, he'd had a few drinks and he was almost inside his house on Bodan Klementsky Street, when he was attacked from behind with a hammer. His neighbours were woken by the screams of his mother when she found his body in the doorway the next morning, with his skull battered and lying in his own blood. Oh my god. They found their second victim just round the corner on Kosaiora Street. Yelena Shram, who was a 28-year-old security guard, was on her way home after leaving work early due to feeling unwell. The single mother was almost home when Igor struck her with a hammer he had concealed in his shirt. The attack continued while she lay on the ground until the two had satisfied their bloodlust. They used the clothes that Yelena had been carrying in a bag to clean the hammer and then left her on the streets. Yelena's mother later said, There was not a part of her that was not destroyed. When we arrived at the morgue, we could not identify her because she had no face. Her sister had to identify her by the clothes that she was wearing. That's appalling. Hmm. Shortly after Yelena's attack, Igor and Victor savagely beat and killed Valentina Hanza. No relation to Alexander Hanza, the friend. Mm-hmm. Just surname. She was the mother of three and the sole carer for his disabled husband. He was now left to care for himself. So... Just ruined the family there. Yeah, I mean, when you read, like, we read this and it's like, mother of four, mother of three, blah, blah, blah. It does sit in that, like, you know, that woman was walking home from work. If she'd stayed at work, she wouldn't have been killed. That girl hadn't walked a friend home, she wouldn't have been killed. If they'd have left an hour earlier. Exactly. Like. Things like that. And, you know, that woman, you know, she was a sole carer for her husband. And, like, it's a tragedy that she's killed. But then the things that roll on after that of she's got three kids, but do they live there? Are they in a different country? Are they miles away? Who's going to look after her husband? You know, for me, I don't know why, that really hit home that usually I can separate myself from it. Yeah. But with this, it was sort of like, these people have, you know, got these families, uh, you know, what happens then? I think it's because the parents are finding them and saying they had no face left. Yeah. And things like that. I think as well, it's the randomness of the attacks. Like you say, I mean, one was a soldier who, under normal normal circumstances, yeah. would have probably been able to have fended him off. But attacking him from behind again. And and he was drunk. Yeah. So just these random targets. And like you say, the, the knock-on effect, no pun intended, um, on the families and loved ones. Yeah, but... I, even after all of these murders, the police didn't think they were dealing with, like, a serial killer or anything. Because the people had nothing in common. Yeah. So, they're not thinking, oh, we've got these people attacking these. these are just, oh, these are just random attacks. But they've all got the same sort of... Yeah, but the police are thinking it's just totally unrelated. I don't know. Surely you'd have put that to get another one with a smashed cranium. Yeah. But the next day, Andrei Sidjuk and Vadim Lyakov, who were both aged 14, had set off from their homes at 3am to catch fish for breakfast. 
As they cycled down a country road, a green car sped past them and pulled over further down the road. The boys saw two people get out and stand with their backs to them, but they just carried on cycling towards them. As they were almost to the car, the two strangers turned round and knocked both boys down with sand-filled pipes. Andre was knocked out cold, but Vadim managed to get to his feet and run away. Igor screamed at Victor to catch him, and he jumped in the car and chased down his prey. Vadim knew the place really well because they always used to travel there, so he veered off into the nearby bushland and he found a place to hide. So he could hear the car stop, the door open, door close, and he could hear his attacker walking round him, searching for him. Eventually Victor gave up and returned to Igor, who was beating Andre in the head with the pipe. He explained that they needed to leave quickly because he couldn't find the other lad, so Igor took one more swing, hit him in the head again, and they both jumped in the car and sped off. When he knew it was safe, Vadim came out of his hiding place and went back to check on Andre. He was lying in a pool of his own blood, but he was still breathing. Right. He managed to flag down a passing car and an ambulance was called. However, Andre was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Oh, that's... That hits again. Mm. That that hits home. You've got that 14-year-old boy who's just seen his friend being killed. Discovered his friend had to hide from an attacker. It's like a horror film, isn't it? Yeah. While he's at the hospital, Vadim was taken into custody by the police and interrogated as they believed he'd killed Andre. What? His mother and stepfather were not allowed to see him as the police threatened him with being sent to a juvenile centre that was notoriously rough and, according to his mother, beating 14-year-old boy. Vadim stuck to his story of what happened and he gave descriptions of the attackers to the police. It was only when his mother threatened to contact the public prosecutor that the police finally let the boy go. Oh my god. So for hours and hours, they were just shouting and screaming, trying to get a confession out of this boy. And he's like, I haven't done it. I haven't done it. Here's, this is what these people look like. They're beating him, won't let him see his mum and dad, saying, you're going to go to this place. It's horrible there. You know, you're going to get beaten up every day. The worst of the worst are there. Just tell us now we can help you out. But no, they won't do anything. Surely, why didn't they ask the, the question, well, why would this lad who knew the area have flagged down a car? They may be thinking, oh, they had an argument and then he feels bad for it or something like that, you know, crime of passion. Yeah. Anything like that. The police finally started looking at links from previous murders um, now that they had an eyewitness attack and a description of the attackers. Oh, it took this long. Yeah, it took this long and his mum's like, I'm going to go to the fucking public prosecutor. Okay, then it's not him. Fucking Ukrainian policeman. Apologies if you are a Ukrainian police person or know a member of them. I'm sure they're fine. Fine now. I'm sure they've improved. There's always a few bad apples that spoil the bunch in any police force. As we know. (laughs) All too well from the events of this year. Black Lives Matter. They do. We're just putting it out there. If you don't like it, fuck yourself. Anyway... The outraged public demanded swift action and dubbed the madmen roaming the streets the Dniproptrevsk maniacs. Catchy. Good name. Good name. It is. The way that you get, you know what I mean? BTK was the best. He suggested loads of names and some of them were fucking shit. When we do BTK, I'll go through all the names, but he wrote a letter to the, like, oh yeah, you haven't been covering me lately. You know, I've, I've done this, I've done that. Here's some names you could call me by. <laughs> And it was like, one was something like the something garotte. That's... And just what the sense... A strangler is always better than garotte, isn't it? Oh, I'll have to... F- I'll, once we finish this, I'll find you the names because they're fucking hilarious. <laughs> so... Victor and Eagle laid low for a few days and then they re-emerged on the 12th of July 2007 to claim another victim. They travelled to a tree-lined road between Dnipro and Tromsk, Tromsk, not Tromsk, that's a totally different place, and planned to pull someone over and video themselves murdering them. Now, this is what went on to be the video, Three Guys, One Hammer. In the video, while they were waiting, Igor said, we can stop a car like that. And if it's a big guy, we say there is no problem and let him go. If it's a little one that comes out, we say welcome with this. And he pulled out the yellow handled hammer and showed it to the camera and said, I will pull it out like this and showed how he would swing it. So once again there, if it's a big guy who could fight back, we won't kill them. But if it's someone weaker than us, we'll prey on him. 
Yeah. While they waited for a victim, they discussed what items they wanted to steal and pointed to bloodstains on the car, arguing about which of the victims they'd come from. Nice. Yeah. That's like, just an argument like that with two friends. It could be about, you know what I mean, about anything like real dick about arguing about stupid things. They're doing it over blood of, oh, that was the person that you killed this. Oh, no, 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 that was from that 14-year-old boy. No, 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 it wasn't. It was from that tramp that we killed on the bench. They're, like, laughing about it like it's fucking totally innocent. Yeah. Victor raised the binoculars and shouted with excitement that someone was coming down the road. The person approaching on a pushbike was Sergei Yaztenko, who was a much-loved family man who loved playing with his grandson. He had left to get petrol for his motorbike and swapped it halfway for a pushbike. Possible that he ran out of fuel. When I read that, I was like, he'd be like, oh, I've run out of petrol. Oh, this is convenient. A pushbike. You know? You've got like images of the bicycle thief. You know, that film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that. It's like, oh. Let's not laugh now because this gets fucking dark. Eagle stood in the middle of the road and Victor grabbed the camera so they could capture everything on tape. As Sergei tried to get past, Eagle swung the hammer into his head and knocked him off the bike. Shit. They both raced over, laughing to Sergei, and Eagle hit him again. They then dragged him into the woodland where Eagle hit him in the face one more time. Eagle told Victor to listen to the man who was trying to speak, but all they heard was gurgling from his throat. Now, the guy had actually had a cancerous tumour removed from his throat, so he could hardly speak at all. It was always a, a whisper. Ah, oh, right. He could only manage a few words and it was always a whisper. He's trying to speak there, but for a mi- whole minute, they, on the video, they'd gone close up and all you can hear is the gurgling of him trying to speak and basically his face being caved in. So after a minute, they continued with the attack with Igor hitting him with an hammer and Victor using a screwdriver, stabbing it into Sergei's eyes until he, you could see brain matter. He then repeatedly stabbed him in the stomach. Sergei was gasping for breath, even though he had no face left, and for eight minutes his brutal torture continued. After breaking both of his arms, they hit him repeatedly in the face with a hammer, and once they realised they were dead, Eagle remarked, What a fucking day for you, huh? After washing their faces and hands, they returned to the body and took pictures of each other Nazi saluting over Sergei's corpse. Now, if any of you haven't gone to watch the video yet, and you were thinking, I'm going to go watch the video after this, everything we've just said there is what you're going to see. In real time. In real time. So when I said there was gurgling for a minute, you're going to hear a man trying to fucking breathe and live for a whole minute after being smashed in the face with a hammer three times. We watch this so you don't have to. Yeah. This is why I skipped through it. Because it was like, it was sort of like the car crash reaction where you're like, I've got to watch. Yeah, it's really, it's really bad. You're so, there's something about something that horrible that just draws you in. Yeah, but it was also, I couldn't watch it all. I had to skip through it because you could hear that. And it's honestly, it's the most, it's the worst thing I've ever watched in my life. And I've seen Legally Blonde, the musical. Fuck, man. You all right? Yeah, yeah. I love Legally Blonde and Legally Blonde too. They're hilarious, but the musical is just terrible. Was it awful? I just don't like musicals. I really like Legally Blonde. I Legally do. Blonde. I don't think this is appropriate. Moving <laughs> on. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the image out of my head. Just Reese Witherspoon in a bikini. Anyway, on the 14th of July 2007, 45-year-old Natalia Marmachuk was knocked off a moped and was dragged to some brushes and beaten to death with a hammer. The main difference with this crime was that the pair were becoming more arrogant and people saw them and even gave chase to them. Shit. However, just a few feet away from the attack, hidden in rags and cardboard, were a brother and sister who were street urchins. They saw the attack and they gave police details description which matched the one that Vadim gave. So now the police have got three eyewitnesses. All of them say this is what the two people look like. Across the next few days, two mutilated bodies were found each day. There was a high number of funerals in the town, and while people who were scared of the attacks, nobody noticed the two boys visiting the graves of each victim, taking selfies of them giving the middle finger to the gravestones in one final insult. 
The audacity of it. They also went to the funerals and would take photos of them when they're carrying the coffin in, of them giving the finger to the coffin. It's, I mean, as horrible as it is, what's worse for me is it's kind of puerile. Yeah. It's very childish. But also here, more murders follows. However, there's not much information in the public records about him because around this time, the police stopped releasing information. Right. Because they were trying to keep it to themselves and not cause any more panic. But one of the victims was an eight-month pregnant woman who was butchered and her fetus was ripped out of the womb. All of the information, as I said there, was kept out in newspapers to avoid the further panic. And they also didn't want to let the suspects know that they knew what they looked like. A task force had been set up with over 2,000 officers from all over the country. And who were looking at all the evidence and they distributed police sketches and also a list of stolen items to all the pawn shops around the area. Igor and Victor knew they'd been spotted several times. However, they still left a survivor in one of their attacks. 70-year-old Lydia Mikrin Sheva was walking her three dogs near her home when she walked down a path surrounded by bushes and was attacked from behind by Igor while Victor, once again, was the cameraman. She fell to the ground unconscious and Igor and Victor repeatedly kicked her in the face trying to dislodge her gold crowns. Her dogs were barking loudly, so the attackers shot them with rubber bullets, killing two and injuring one. They fled the scene, worried that someone would be coming after they heard the dogs bark, leaving Lydia with serious internal and external injuries. Her jaw was shattered and her face had to be rebuilt. However, their reign of terror came to an end on the 23rd of July 2007, when they went to sell a victim's phone in a pawn shop. Now, there's three versions of how they got caught here. So one is the pawn shop clerk turned on the phone to see if it worked, which alerted the police who were looking for it and monitoring its signal. Right. Okay. Another version of events is that the clerk recognised them and contacted the police. But the third version is that a friend of theirs had been arrested and gave them up. Oh. We'll come to him after we finish the whole story because that's one of the conspiracy theories around it. Yeah. Okay, so whichever it was, the police now had the Dnepro-Trevisk maniacs in custody. I'll never get that name right. The police went into the boys' houses and also Alexander's house. Victor's father refused to let them in for 40 minutes, but he finally relented and let them in. The police retrieved items from both Victor and Igor's wardrobes that were covered with bloodstains, along with an earring ripped from a victim's ear, the yellow-handled hammer computer equipment that had videos and photos of the attacks on, and also Igor's scrapbook of the newspaper clippings of the crimes. Also, on Igor's bedside table, there was a copy of Mein Kampf. Of course there was. Scrapbook, Mein Kampf. You're not, you're not breaking much ground there, Igor. No. The police interviewed Victor first, who initially said he acted alone, but then later admitted Igor had taken part in the killings. When asked how many people he killed, he said, I don't know. Maybe 19? As the police finally asked the question, everyone wanted to know, why had they done this? Victor meekly said he'd kill for money, but Igor, Igor just liked to kill. When they asked Igor what he felt when he murdered someone, he smirked and said, how do you feel when you cut a sausage? He was asked why Victor had videoed the attacks. He said simply, to remember. Yeah, because we all do that, don't we? Yeah. They were formally charged with involvement in 21 murders, 8 assaults, 5 robberies and 1 count of animal cruelty. Alexander was only charged with 2 counts of robbery. Because Alexander hadn't been there while they were killing people. Yeah. He'd left before that. So the Ukrainian people and the victims' families were baying for blood. But the three boys' parents rallied around them. They would have, yeah. Igor and Victor's parents threw all of their influence behind getting their sons free and maintained that the boys were innocent and had been set up by the true criminals. So the true criminals. Yeah. So I've kept that out of there, this, because I just won't get to the facts. We'll go over these conspiracy theories at the end. The press and the police were sceptical of the boys' innocence, as the papers reported it took 40 minutes for Victor's father to answer the door to the police, and a neighbour had heard a sewer pipe rumbling. The next day, it was reported that a plumber found watches, jewellery, and also mobile phones that belonged to the murder victims. So, he'd flushed them. Smart. That's why no one's going in for 40 minutes, because he's flushing evidence. That's the worst way of disposing of evidence as well. 
Yeah, but especially a mobile phone. Yeah. Would have been Nokia's then as well, them big Nokia's. Shit a brick. Yeah. Hey! (laughs) Eagle was confident that his father would get him out of trouble again, and even told his mother, don't worry, I'm going to be home soon. Usually, in cases that involved families of the rich, money was paid, evidence was lost, and witnesses suddenly developed amnesia. This case was a lot different. They had hundreds of photographs and videos of the boys carrying out attacks and posing with victims. From videos of torturing kittens to selfies of them flipping off the victims' coffins, the police had more than enough evidence, and the 30 mini video of them preparing to and carrying out the killing of Sergei Yastenko was just the icing on the cake. Victor's father said that the pictures and videos had been faked, and it was a conspiracy by the police. All right. Now, how we're saying we, we've seen that video, Three Guys, One Hammer. The two boys didn't actually release it. Somehow the video of the murder of Sergei Yastenko was leaked to the internet under the name of Three Guys, One Hammer. Which, if it had been faked, as his dad says, it would have taken millions of dollars in Hollywood's best facial effects artists years Like, like a proper to do Stan it. Winston sort yeah. of job. Shortly after their arrest, all three boys were giving psychiatric evaluations and were found sane. However, Igor pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Because apparently his lawyer said, oh no, his grandmother had schizophrenia. It's hereditary. Convenient. At the trial, Victor's father represented him when he fired his lawyer. Victor's dad worked for public prosecutions. So he's like, I can represent my son. And his old lawyer was quite glad that he did. Because he said, he keeps changing his story. I can't defend him properly. I'm fucking glad to wash my hands of this. Isn't it a conflict of interest? Like, it's it is that. a conflict of interest, yeah. but, you know, he's rich and powerful in the Ukraine. He can do what he wants, can't he? So the murder of Sergei was played before the court, which was including Sergei's widow, with the killers exchanging glances and smirking at each other while it was being played. When questioned about the video, both denied seeing anyone they recognised in the video, resulting with the judge shouting, You are not blind! So even the judge is getting pissed off with them. All of the other videos and photos were shown, and testimony showed that DNA collected from their clothes said it was a 99.9% chance that they were guilty. Victor's father then claimed that his son had a form of Stockholm Syndrome, and Igor forced him into the killings. Alexander pleaded guilty to his robbery charge and said he had no idea what the other two were capable of, and if he had, he wouldn't have gone near them, not even at gunpoint. Eagle just sat quietly throughout the proceedings, enjoying seeing his videos and the attention he was getting. On February the 11th, 2009, the court found Igor and Victor guilty of all charges and they received life sentences. Alexander was found guilty of robbery and was sentenced to nine years. Igor and Victor both appealed straight away, but the decision was upheld by the Supreme Court. And Alexander, he didn't even appeal his decision. You know, he literally said, I did the robberies, I'll save my time, I'm guilty. Good, good guy, sort of. <laughs> to be fair, he was robbing because he was poor. Mm. And when I mean poor, I don't mean with skin, I mean, these are people who are queuing up at 6am in the morning to get a loaf of bread, poor, where they will work and they will get paid in coupons to get food, not actual money. Yeah. So we're talking fucking dirt poor so he was robbing to survive in a way however the other guys they don't need to no so the conspiracy theories i was on about right okay what their parents were saying was there was a millionaire who they'd got in touch with from these gore sites they were like we love your work blah 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 and he was paying them to make him 40 snuff films so he could sell them Right. There's no evidence of this, no communication on the computers, nothing like that. But that's what his parents are saying. There was another mastermind criminal, they were just the puppets. Right. You know, leave my kids alone, leave the kids alone, go after the puppet master. There was also, it was an attempt to discredit their family because they had influences going up to the former president and stuff like that. Right. So remember when I said, um, a friend of theirs had got arrested. Yeah, yeah. And that. This 
guy was called Daniel Kozlov. And he'd been Victor's friend since they were at kindergarten. and They were close friends. He was known to hang out with Igor and Victor. And neighbours have said they've seen like Victor um, Igor's green Dayu pull up, honk his horn, and he'd go out to him. He'd been arrested. Some people say it was for the murders. Others say it was for hooliganism. He was the son of a powerful and well-connected father with ties to officials. So Kozlov had known the trio's activities since they had come home from a vacation in the village of Kirilovka in early June 2007, and excitedly told him that they'd killed two people. He'd seen the video and the pictures of their crimes, and he told the police everything he knew. He said, oh yeah, they were boasting to me that they robbed and killed random people, and they wanted him to join them, and saying, oh, you know, we can make a lot of money out of this. They showed him all the expensive computer equipment that they'd been buying, and they claimed it was a reward to their crimes. So, Dano provided all this information to the police, along with the testimony of two surviving victims. That was the main thread upon the investigation was being based. Right. He said everything he knew, and people thought, mm, we think he's involved with it. But with his willingness to talk, and having a well-connected family, it meant he was never charged. And he soon disappeared from sight. There are unsubstantiated reports that he killed himself soon after, providing the evidence, but others believe that he was whisked away so as not to have the family name dragged into any further scandal. Right. So, that was the Dniprotrift Maniacs. Dnipro Maniacs. I'm going to go and say that's the most brutal fucking case we've ever covered. Definitely in terms of brutality. I know we've done Junko through it and Sylvia Likens and fucking Carla Holmoka and Paul Bernardo, but you have to use your imagination for them. You can literally go on the internet now and find that video, see them commit that. Um, in this video, you're going to see blurred out pictures of them posing with his body and also with dead animals. Yeah. I post fucking death photos and autopsy photos because... We like to go in depth and give you all the facts, and I'm not going to skirt it when it comes to showing you. No, no. I get in a lot of trouble with YouTube for it, but... But it's like you can't... You got, we, we like giving them, like you say, the uh, the facts, it's, the gory details. It's historical data that we're giving you. But with this, it's fucking... They are literally psychotic. Yeah. They literally just went around murdering people for fucking fun. Yeah. If it was, they were poor, like Alexander, they were doing it for money. He'd be like, yeah, they were doing it for money. They got carried away. No, these guys didn't need the fucking money. They just thought they could get away with anything because the parents were rich. So like, dad can fucking make everything go away. You can imagine him like fucking throwing brick through a window of someone's house and the police come in and they're like, do you know who my fucking dad is? Yeah. And the policeman's like, oh yeah, okay, you get on your way. It's fucking harrowing and it's disgusting. It's, yeah, it's one of the worst and just the randomness of it as well. It was just people walking. They weren't targeted for, they hated them or they slighted them in anything. It was a homeless man sleeping on a bench, a man on a push bike, going to get petrol and going to see his grandson, a woman walking back from a friend's house after having a meal with her, a man walking back from a nightclub at night, which we've all fucking done. Yeah. We've had a few drinks, we've walked home. You didn't think anything about it. And no. all of the attacks have come from fucking behind or unsuspecting, literally because they were cowards. When they'd done the thing of hanging over the balcony to get rid of their fear, they became but they said, oh, we've got no phobias. So they picked on younger kids. They didn't go after the bullies who were bullying them. They picked on weaker individuals. And then when they were killing people, they'd hit them from behind. And as they said on the video, if it's a big guy, we say there's no problem and we let him go. Because they know they'll get the fucking ass kicked. So they're psychotic, but they're also fucking chicken shit cowards. Yeah. Yeah, they're literally the worst of humankind. Pieces of shit. They're scum. They're fucking scum. And I'm glad they're going to rot in jail for all fucking eternity. And if you are thinking about watching Three Guys, One Hammer, I would strongly suggest against it. Yeah. If you have got morbid curiosity, as I've said, you make your own choice, but we highly recommend you do not do it. I'm not posting a link to it 
was talking to one of our subscribers on Twitter in DMs, and I said we were doing this. He was like, oh, will you post a link to the video? And I'm like, no, I'm not fucking posting that video. You can find it with easily within 10 minutes of searching it on Google. I'm pretty sure you can find it. But we've seen it, and I wouldn't recommend you watch it because it's fucking horrible. Yeah. And you have to remember, that's a man's life that was taken away. That was a husband and a grandfather who... Who'd recovered from cancer as yeah. well. He'd also, he also, when he was younger, had a tractor turnover on him, and he almost died as well. So this is a man who, his only crime was cycling down a road at the wrong time. And being fucking unlucky by the sounds of it. Sorry to end that on such a downer, but guys, please let us know what you think. Once again, thank you so much for subscribing. We are over that 1,000 mark now. Just thank you so much. Um, We'll keep doing this as much as we can. As we said, we try to get videos out as quick as we can. Fucking work gets in the way. I got a PC now, though. Well, it's... It's on order. It's on order. Unless he's going to have a PC, and I'm also going to teach him how to edit. So, hopefully, we speed things up as well. So, we'll get a couple of videos out after I've checked your work, of course, Les. Yes. You have to quality check it. Make sure you've got those transitions and those drawings of me posting cum in there at yeah. right times. Yeah, yeah. You know me. I've got, I got my other channel, and I? I do my edits. I do me edits. I do me edits. I just use, I just do it on a phone and it's a different system to what I'll be using. I'll learn. I know you will. You're quick learning. I am. Quick learning. I'll give you a little pat on the head. A little ruffle of the hair. Do a kooky. Yeah, I've got a kooky in my pants. <laughs> but guys, remember, reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email us at enterthedarkpodcast at gmail.com. I am Jan from Film Daddy. <laughs> He is Les from Tales from the Hangman, who cannot speak because I've just sexually harassed him. Please take care, have fun, stay safe, don't accept cookies from strangers.